Today we're going to make the dials. There's a large one on the back and a smaller one on the side. The one on the back is 50 thousandths per turn, with the resolution down to half a thou. The small one on the side is for whole turns. 20 turns gives us the full inch we can measure. When we make these, the etched parts will be filled in and have a much higher contrast. To start I'm using engraver's brass, and sadly this isn't the best piece. It has a lot of small surface imperfections straight from the factory, but let's see if we can work with it. I'll start by gently sanding the front side with 800 grit wet dry sandpaper. I've dipped the sandpaper in water, and I'm using just enough pressure to clean and rough up the surface slightly. Often you're told to use acetone to do the final cleaning, but I've found that's not necessary, and honestly it seems to create more problems with the mask than it's worth. I'm using a spare flooring tile for this next step. I'm going to mask the back side first. Especially on this large dial, the back will be visible. And it's so easy to get caught up in getting the front side good, and masking on the back isn't done well. Plus, the masking material we're going to use for the front will overlap and create a great acid-proof seal. I'm using ordinary packing tape, and I'm cutting it a bit bigger than the workpiece and sticking the tape to the tile. I'm rolling the roll itself to help make sure all the edges are down. But for the back, bubbles don't matter. I left an overlap of about a quarter inch at the top and bottom. I'll leave about the same quarter inch on the sides when I trim it, and then gently peel it off the tile. Once off, I'll fold the tape over onto the front. For the masking, I'm using a special kind of material meant for laser cutting and then sandblasting. I found you can use it for acid etching too, but this is definitely an off-label use. I've tried other methods, like print toner and photosensitive mask, but this works really well and is a lot less effort. It's also great later when we are removing the excess paint. To my knowledge, no one else is using this method. Like the packing tape, I'm going to cut the laser tape a bit bigger than the workpiece. The extra material will be used later to overlap onto the back. Once cut to size, Peel the tape off mostly, and then at one edge, get it really flat and bubble free. You can then use the laser tape roll itself to roll the tape down and get it virtually bubble free easily each time. Once down, give it a few rolls to help burnish it. I'm placing it in the freezer. The laser tape is actually made of two materials the laser tape itself, and the other is a clear plastic coating on top that keeps it from sticking to itself. This clear plastic coating needs to be removed and it's quite tricky to do it. Putting it in the freezer makes the top plastic stiffer and easier to remove. Five or so minutes should be plenty. Or it should have been five minutes, but this time I got a phone call and it ended up being in the freezer for over an hour. The bottom material froze so much it cracked and separated a bit from the top which caused the problems you'll see in a minute. I'm going to stick the edges of the tape down to the tile and then deploy my other trick. Take an extra piece of the masking material and place it under a corner. And then use your fingernail really fast to try to separate the two layers. The freezing makes the top layer stiffer, and this part a lot easier. Though because of the tears, it was a bit more of a struggle than usual. This is by far the most difficult time I've ever had removing the top layer. Carefully peel everything off the tile and take the extra and stretch it around to the back. This will seal the packing tape in really nicely and keep the acid out. In this case though, because of the cracks from over freezing I'm using some extra tape to cover up those spots. This should work okay. Lastly, I'm making a center mark on the diagonal. This will be used in the laser to keep our part close to center and make sure we don't run into the edges. It's finally time to cut the laser tape. I'm going to use the center mark to line up the laser. This takes the guesswork out of finding center and making sure you have enough space to cut. Once 
once out of the laser, one of my favorite moments in all of this, pulling off the laser tape. I found an old dental pick works really well to get it started. The tiny pluses are where holes will be drilled later. Once the cut parts are removed, I give it another roll or two to squeeze out any air bubbles and really get those edges down. And that's it! A beautiful mask, ready to acid etch. When I etch the piece, I'm going to do it upside down. This will let the etch material fall out and speed up the process. However, I couldn't find any suitable plastic on hand, so I did the uh, easy thing and quickly modeled a part and 3D printed four ideal pieces of plastic. The entire process was only about 15 minutes. I just taped them to the material and we're ready to etch. For the etch, I'm using ferric chloride. I'll talk later about the other methods I've tried, but this is by far the best and I've found for deep etching it works really well. Once the etch starts, I stop by about every 10 minutes just to give it a gentle shake to agitate. After just an hour, I'll take it out and rinse it off. The etch looks deep with beautiful sharp edges. First step is to remove the plastic supports. Then I'll put the part out in the sun to dry it off. Once ready, I'm using some black enamel paint to fill in the etched areas. In the sun on a warm day I did five coats about 10 minutes apart. The etch was deep enough, this left the paint a bit below the surface. When done painting, I put it on an old laboratory style heater on a very low heat and let the paint cure for several hours. An old toaster oven would have been perfect for this. And now, for what has to be one of the most satisfying moments of the entire process. Now it's time to cut the piece out. In the mill I'm going to set up some parallels with a piece of 2x4. I'm not normally a fan of putting wood in the mill, but we really need some backing here. Off camera, I've prick and center punched the holes to be drilled. There's a ton of ways to locate a hole, but in this situation I'm using the coaxial indicator. You can pick them up pretty cheaply these days, and when you're not in a hurry, I think for this kind of task they're really underappreciated. Once you get the hang of it, and you've already got the spindle fairly close, it only takes a moment to get it dialed into under a thou. Don't sweat the countersink dimensions, I'll get those right later. I'm drilling the center hole to just over 300 thousandths, the correct diameter for what will pass through it. I'm going to use this circle cutting tool to cut the dial out. First, notice it has a quarter inch drill in the middle. This drill is crap for going through brass, and our hole is already larger than a quarter inch, so it's not going to do anything anyway. The outside edge cutter is more interesting though. It's made of high speed steel, and notice how it's currently set up. It's going to make a straight up and down cut on the outside, but put a bevel on the inside. This is the opposite of what we want. Notice too there's a relief grind on the back. If we were to just turn this around so the straight edge was on the inside, the relief would be at the front, and that wouldn't cut well at all. We have a couple choices. One is to run the mill backwards. The relief cut is only in the front if we keep cutting in the same direction. And because we've taken the drill out of the equation, that's a valid option. But I know not everyone can do that. So I decide to take another option, which is to flip the bit around. And on the bench grinder, grind another cutting point, but with the right relief so that the mill can run forward. Back in the mill, 
and once I get the radius set correctly, it's time to cut. I'm running at a fairly low RPM, about 200, and I'm cutting a bit bigger than what will be the final dimension. I'm taking my time and feeding carefully by hand, and before you know it, we're through. The edge will need a little cleanup in the lathe, so I'm cutting some round pieces of plastic cutting board out. One a little bit bigger, and then another one a little bit smaller. You'll see why in a moment. I love this cutting board material. You can get it cheap, less than 10 bucks for a pack of three sizes, and you can pick it up anytime you need it at the local home improvement store. It cuts easily if you don't mind a little bit of bird nesting. In this case, the quarter inch drill size does matter. Remember how the hole in the dial was larger than a quarter inch? Well, for this next step, I do need that hole to be a quarter inch, so I made a small bushing and pressed it into the dial. I'll be removing it when the next step is complete. To clean up the edge in the lathe, I've already made two metal pieces from some scrap. One is held in the chuck, and the other is a piece of aluminum with a short steel rod pressed into it. The steel rod slides into the piece in the chuck. I'm putting the dial between the plastic pieces and putting the steel rod through all of them. This is then put into the chuck. I'm bringing the tailstock in, locking it to the bed, and then extending the ram until the live center is firmly pressing everything together. Here the roughness of the plastic really helps. And I can take light cuts with no problem to bring it to final dimensions with a clean edge. We're finally ready to polish. Back at the bench, I'm bringing the tile back, and I have two pieces of sandpaper, 1000 grit and 2000 grit, and I'm going to tape them down at the edges. I find doing it at the edge of the table is great because I can really hold on to it easily, keep it flat, and rotate it 90 degrees regularly. I'll start on the 1000 grit side, and then switch to the 2000 with a good rinse in between. I'm also using a drop of soap to break up the surface tension to make this work better. Every few minutes, I use a squirt bottle to get the used grit off the paper and dial. Even with these high grits, we don't need to worry about getting every tiny little last scratch out. After each rinse, I use less pressure until it's basically just the weight of the dial. My favorite polish is Rub and Bright. Sort of funny story here, when I had my first container, my dog, who normally has no interest in anything but dog food, got a hold of the container, clawed it open, and ate almost the entire thing. When I discovered this, I was in a panic, and even though it was late, I called the number on the back. Judy answered even though it was after midnight, her time. She let me know any ingredients I might need to be concerned about, not that there really were any, and I relayed that information to the pet poison people who let me know I needed to keep an eye on my dog, but I didn't really need to take any emergency measures. Thankfully, my dog was fine with no major problems. I was doubly happy a few days later when I got a package from Judy, which had a whole new container for free. Not only that, but some treats from my dog. A really great product, and I can't say enough about Judy. Okay, time to put this to work. I'm putting a little on the dial and then using my Dremel tool at medium speed with a buffing wheel. You can feel when you get enough pressure to have a slight drag and know that it's working. A little bit of resistance, and the polish turns a deep black. I'll usually do this two times, though even after only once there's already a big difference. Sadly, I haven't gone down deep enough to remove some of those defects in the brass that were there originally, but I'm going to go with it. The Dremel will leave some mild marks though, so I'll do the final pass by hand. Apply it, let it dry before buffing it off with a soft cloth. And when it's done, hey, it came out pretty good. I did the small dial with the same process, and I'm very happy how these came out. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. The process of figuring out how to best make these dials took about eight months on and off. 
For a long time, I was trying to use muriatic acid and hydrogen peroxide as the etchant, but I was never really satisfied with the results. This method comes from the community that etches its own printed circuit boards, and for that it's fine. But for the nice deep etches I need, it never really worked well. Here's some of the reasons I was unhappy with muriatic acid and hydrogen peroxide. First, it makes a lot of bubbles when it's working. I never wanted to try doing it upside down because I was concerned the bubbles would cling to certain areas and give uneven results. And all those bubbles meant I had to brush them away frequently, which meant standing over it every few minutes, and that releases a lot of gas. And that gas is at least part chlorine gas, which is a great way to fry your sinuses, or worse, even if you're careful. But the thing is, it only works sort of well when fresh. Once it sat for a couple of days, even if I added more hydrogen peroxide or tried to aerate it, I still couldn't get a consistent strength. So I couldn't have a set amount of time to leave the piece in. And this was even with the 9% hydrogen peroxide from the beauty supply store. Because I refreshed the acid regularly, it meant I had a ton of waste. And you can't pour this stuff down your drain. Remember, it eats through copper, which is what your pipes are made of. But more importantly, environmentally, it needs proper disposal. So minimizing waste is a good thing. Lastly, by the time I settled on laser tape for the masking, I discovered it could only withstand about 15 minutes in fresh acid before it would start to bubble and come off. This limited the amount of time I had, which meant shallow etches, and occasionally it would get under the mask where it would start to bubble, and then start to etch where I didn't want it to. Ferric chloride has fewer of these downsides. It's slower, but it can be reused time and time again and is very consistent. Most importantly, it doesn't interact with the laser tape at all or make any bubbles. Plus, once you consider you can use the same bottle over and over and over again, it's pretty cheap, about $15 a quart, so it produces a lot less waste. It still needs to be handled and disposed of properly, but for this kind of deep etching, I found it to be a big win. Speaking of laser tape, I tried several other methods before picking this as my favorite. Again, following the lead of the printed circuit board community, I tried one of their longtime favorites, using an iron to transfer from paper printed on a laser printer. But because modern laser printers use a newer, high temp toner formulation, I couldn't get it to work well at all, until I hunted around and finally found an older printer. After many tries to get a good print, I discovered the muriatic acid mixture actually would find its way through the tiny pinholes in the printed raster pattern, and this looked terrible, even with the print quality cranked up as dark as it would go. It also flaked off really easily. So then I switched to photosensitive film. This worked pretty okay, but I had a difficult time with the film sticking to itself, and also how much it would bubble after applying. I realized later, I think my acetone was at least partly to blame for that, but I didn't like how many steps this process had, and you had to be careful about light exposure and required chemicals to develop. When I started playing around with the laser, I tried ablating two coats of lacquer, and this actually worked pretty well. It's really cheap, but it had one big downside compared to the laser tape, which is after you spray on the paint, you then have to sand off the paint and the lacquer, and this would require going down to a pretty rough grit, which would take a lot more work to get it back to really smooth. But after the laser tape, if you have access to a laser, this is the method I recommend. I know what you're thinking, but wait, this means I need access to a laser, and they're hard to find and super expensive. I'd suggest they're not as hard to find or expensive as you might think. There's tons of maker spaces out there for which a laser is a staple tool. Even many local libraries now have lasers people can use. And if you want to buy your own, there's a cheap one, commonly known as the K40, available on eBay or Amazon for around $400. Even Walmart sells them. These can take some tweaking and they aren't the highest quality, but they're plenty good for this kind of work. And given how useful lasers are for many things, it's something to consider. After filming this, I made an improvement to the lathe sandwich. I turned a shoulder on the piece in the chuck so I could use more clamping force from the tailstock. And I also switched using a parting tool to turn down the edges. This worked really great. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.